Hello students, today we're going to talk about ethics and social science research. For our Introduction to Social Science Research class, our Research Skills class, and this is a very important topic, um, how to treat people ethically when we are doing research. A lot of this information comes from one of our textbooks, Loon and Berg, about ethical issues in research. They name several ethical concerns, harm, consent, privacy, and the confidentiality of data, honesty, integrity, and the responsibility of reporting data. The fundamental tenet of ethics in research is do no harm. So I know we all want to accomplish things, but even a higher priority is not hurting anyone. There are several reasons that researchers act unethically. A big one is simply poor planning and improper design. And we've all kind of waited until the last minute or we get lazy or something like that. But um, when others are involved and we plan poorly or we don't design well, then people get hurt. Uh, Self-interest also. So sometimes researchers want to publish or they want the prestige or they want a promotion or whatever it might be and so they they step on people in order to get that <clears throat> sometimes people simply make the excuse that uh, what they're doing is not wrong they kind of justify themselves even though actually it is wrong sometimes people cite the greater good saying that look if we just harm a small group of people it'll help everybody however um, harming people for the sake of the greater good is um, unethical. There's also simply a lack of empathy or concern or respect or love for the people that they're studying. So sometimes people, researchers can treat their participants as objects rather than subjects as uh, less than human and that is um, unethical as well. We need to show empathy, concern and respect for the people that we are studying. And I'm sure there are other reasons as well that perhaps you can think of. All of these are reasons why researchers act unethically. <clears throat> Excuse me. A brief history of ethics in the social sciences. Um, so the origins are in biomedical research and ethics. By the way, this photo is not related to biomedical research. It's from MIT, but I thought it was an interesting photo. Um, so. During uh, World War II, there was Nazi experimentation and torture of unwilling human subjects. So people were not uh, wanting that to happen to them, but they were forced into it, which led after the war to the Nuremberg Code, uh, which required voluntary consent. So if you didn't want to participate, you didn't have to. Later, there was the Declaration of Helsinki in 1964, adopted by the World Health Organization, and uh, later Ethical Guidelines for Clinical Investigation in 1966, adopted by the American Medical Association. Here is the Nuremberg Code. I won't read it all right now, but a couple of major points. The first one the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. Number two, the experiment should be such as to yield fruitful results for the good of society. It should not be random and unnecessary. So this needs the, the purpose of the research needs to be for good and not just for some random reason or something like that. Number four here, the experiment should be conducted to avoid all unnecessary physical, mental, and mental suffering and injury. And you can keep reading uh, a lot of important things in the Nuremberg Code here. A couple of examples of um, unethical research, the Tuskegee syphilis study that happened in the United States. 400 black men with syphilis were studied without their consent. They were lied to and uh, doctors um, actually discovered the cure in the 1950s, but the men were blocked from receiving the cure. So even though these men could have been cured, the, they were not allowed to. Uh, the local doctors were not, 
were told not to give the men penicillin. So these men continued to have syphilis for the rest of their lives. And then at the end of their lives, they were given a free burial so that doctors could perform op- autopty, op- excuse me, autopsies without the family's consent. So that means they could you know, look at their bodies and uh, dead bodies. And uh, because it was a free burial, the family had, was giving up the right to no autopsy. This, um, you know, rightly enough, led to deep suspicion among the black community of anyone, especially white doctors and white researchers who wanted to conduct biomedical research on them. So one of the byproducts, not only that these men uh, died and they shouldn't have died, but um, now it creates distrust um, and uh you know, that is a sad thing because uh, sometimes people can get help, but but there's been uh, this like breach of trust, a broken relationship, and, and now uh, it's hard to repair those breaches. Another famous example, Stanley Milgram's experiment on authority and control. This is a little bit hard to explain, but it's an important one because you'll run into it if you ever read about psychology or anything like that. So Milgram wanted to see if people would follow the orders of authority figures, even if it went against their consciences or morals. So if they see someone as an authority figure, like a doctor or a teacher or a researcher or a politician, would people obey them even against their better judgment. So he had three people in this. He had the experimenter right here, E, and the teacher, and the teacher was actually the participant. So these were volunteers, and then they had the learner. Now the learner was actually an actor who would pretend. So this teacher did not know that though. So the experimenter would say, we are going to uh, try a new method of teaching. And so whenever the learner got a wrong answer, the teacher was supposed to push a button that would give the learner an electric shock. And the learner would yell or scream as if he was being shocked. Now, of course, he was not really being shocked. He was just acting. But... The teacher, this participant, believed it because, you know, they, they were being lied to, basically. And nobody got hurt, right, because it wasn't a real electric shock. But afterwards, these quote-unquote teachers these, uh, exper- the, that the experimenters were observing felt very guilty because they thought, oh my gosh, I've hurt someone, I've given them electric shocks. And um, Stanley Milgram, who organized the experiment, didn't really anticipate the emotional trauma that these uh, participants would experience. So he, in some ways, he was correct, but he was too correct because these people would give electric shocks. Well, they weren't real electric shocks, but they thought they were electric shocks. And then afterwards, these participants were so like, Uh, upset and guilty that they had done this to another human being and Stanley Milgram uh, had basically created an emotional trauma type situation for them so he did not anticipate that another famous one is Zimbardo's Stanford prison experiment Um, this was done in California in the uh, Stanford University Uh, Dr. Zimbardo created an artificial jail on campus and he paid participants, basically students, to act as inmates and guards. So one group of students were the inmates, one group of students were the guards. And he expected that the guards would begin to abuse their power even though all the participants knew the whole situation was fake. So his guess was his hypothesis, you might say, was that these guards, even though it was not a real situation, that when you're given power, people abuse it. So his hypothesis was correct, but 
the guards actually mistreated the prisoners. The guards abused them. And he did not think about the fact that if these guards abused their power, that the inmates would be harmed. Um, actually, he called off the experiment after six days after pressure from his girlfriend. So this, the guards were abusing the prisoners, hurting them, and finally he was convinced to stop the experiment. So once again, the, this ethical principle of do no harm was not followed. Um, informed consent, we mentioned a bit earlier, but um, informed consent statements like this one here explain the potential risks and benefits of participating in a study. And usually you have a statement that the person understands the potential risks and benefits and it needs to be signed and dated. And you can see an example right here. Um, there's a bit of a trick though because, not trick, but a balance between undersharing or minimizing the risks risks and oversharing revealing too much of the research purpose. So if I reveal a lot of the research purpose, then it might influence how the participants behave during the experiment or during the observation or during the research, whatever kind of research it is. So if I say too much about what we're going to do, then they might not act naturally. But if I don't tell them what we're going to do, then I'm not being open and honest and they might not want to participate. Uh, so uh, there's a bit of a balance, right? You need to explain the risks, but then at the same time, if you're going to do real research, people need to do it as naturally as possible. Two types of consent, active and passive consent. This is particularly an issue when studying children in school. So do you need to get you know, permission from all the parents? Um, a researcher has to mail out a consent form or email or somehow send out a consent form to all the parents. Active consent means that the parents show their consent by signing and returning an informed consent form. So they're saying, yes, my, par my child can participate. What's the problem with this? Lots of parents don't fill out the form and then you only have a few children participating in your study. If you have a low response rate, then you have a small group of children and then the sample is what we call non-representative. It means the sample is so small or so kind of skewed that you can't generalize from that sample. On the other side, there's a passive consent option which means that the parents show their consent by not signing and returning a form refusing participation. So that means basically everybody is participating unless they say no. Now you can see how this might lead to some problems. What if the parent didn't receive the email or the, or the paper or the text message? Or what if the parent doesn't read that language that it was sent in or doesn't understand it? Or what if the child hid it and didn't show the parent? Then the non-response, does that actually mean that they're consenting? No, it just means that the parent didn't read it or didn't understand it. So passive consent has its own ethical issues. Uh, two important terms, confidentiality and anonymity. Confidentiality, the researcher knows the identities of the participants, but he or she actively pro protects the participants' identities using pseudonyms, which are like just fake names, and by keeping the records locked up or password protected. Most qualitative researchers know their participants. Um, therefore, confidentiality is more of an issue than anonymity because in qualitative research, you interview someone usually face to face, so you'll know who they are. Anonymity is different. That means that the participants' identities are unknown even to the researcher. Uh, so maybe it's like, a, like some kind of online survey, and in that case, you don't know who the person is. Different countries have different laws about confidentiality. 
Some researchers may be required by law to identify their participants if ordered to do so. It depends on your country. Um, this is a bit of a touchy issue in the United States, um, I know. So what if you know, one of the participants has confessed to a crime or committed a crime, and then can the government force the researcher to reveal the identity of that participant? Um, some researchers have refused and then they go to jail for it. Some researchers, when required by the governing authorities, do turn over the, um, the identities of those participants. So it's kind of like, do you obey the government there or your conscience on that issue? Institutional review boards. Uh, these are groups of experts, a body of experts, and lay people. Lay people are simply non-experts who review research proposals before granting approval. So let's imagine that you are a professor in a university. You want to do research. You need to write up a proposal and give it to the institutional review board at your university. Those people will read it, think about it, talk about it, and then they will either say, yes, you can, or no, you can't. Um, so because scientists have done research badly and unethically, it has made it evident that institutional review boards are necessary. Um, Sometimes, though, researchers are upset about institutional review boards because they move slowly or cautiously, and some researchers think that these institutional review boards are impeding or slowing down scientific research. Um, and these review boards initially were for biomedical research, but now for social science research. Also, usually you need to get approval from an institutional review board. So despite the problems of institutional review boards, they're slow, they're cautious, all of that, it is an important precautionary measure to protect human subjects. Human subjects are the people who participate in research, not the researchers, but the people who participate in the research, like those who are interviewed or those who receive medical treatment or some kind of experiment. Those are the, what we call human subjects. Let's think about qualitative research and institutional review boards. <clears throat> qualitative research is more intrusive than quantitative research. For quantitative research, you just fill out a survey or a questionnaire and that's it. But qualitative research is more intrusive, right? You have to talk to someone, someone comes to your house or to your neighborhood or to your office and it's more uh, person to person and specifically ethnography is ideal for studying hard to reach populations. So if you want to study drug addicts or criminals, then a qualitative researcher can go and meet those people, be with them, talk with them, observe them. Those types of people are not going to fill out a Google form or a survey monkey form or something like that probably. But if you're going to study criminals or drug dealers or something, usually you have to deceive them a bit. You can't say, look, I'm a researcher from the university down the street and I want to study um, how you behave. Usually you have to pretend that you're not a researcher. So you have to maybe lie about your identity. Um, pretend like you are a member of their community. Uh, and, of course, lying to subjects has some ethical ramifications. You know, if I'm going to study criminals, should I lie and pretend like I'm one of them? A couple of different roles for qualitative researchers. The covert role is when the researcher does not reveal his identity and purpose. So the researcher is with people, studying those people, but he or she does not say, I'm a researcher and this is my purpose. An overt role, the people that he or she is talking to, they know who he is. They know he's a researcher, she's a researcher. They know that 
they are talking with someone who is studying them. You can probably think about the advantages and disadvantages of these. With a covert role, people act naturally because they don't know that you're a researcher. So they just do their normal things. With an overt role, if people know, oh, there's a researcher who's observing me, they might act differently than they normally do. And so then that influences their behavior. Of course, an overt role is more um, obviously ethical, right? Because you're not lying, you're not deceiving, you're saying exactly who you are. Um, one of the downsides of the overt role, of course, is that it can um, influence people's behavior unnaturally. A couple of other issues in qualitative research. Um, even voluntary participation might not be as voluntary as it seems. What does that mean? For example, students in a college class, they might volunteer for their professor's study because they're afraid of bad grades or mistreatment, right? So like if a professor says, hey, I'm going to do a study. Do you guys want to participate? Some students might feel forced to because, oh no, my professor is going to give me a bad grade if I don't participate. Or they might think maybe the professor will give me a good grade if I participate. So students might quote unquote volunteer, but they are either afraid or hoping to get something out of it. The same with prisoners um, or other people. They might volunteer for a study not necessarily just for the purposes of research, but maybe they want someone to listen to their story or receive other benefits. Maybe they're hoping that you'll, you know, help them get legal help, or maybe you'll, that you'll help them financially or something like that. Another interesting issue is that voluntary permit participation in some ways might skew the results. Skew means to make them um, unbalanced or um, not representative. Some people argue that researchers can't get a representative sample based on voluntary participation, right? Because people who volunteer are people that are excited about research or interested in it, but there are thousands and thousands of people who don't volunteer for the research and maybe they have different attitudes or different ideas about the research topic and will never know because they haven't volunteered. But Voluntary participation is better than the alternative, which is involuntary participation, right? So voluntary participation is really the only thing we have because we can't force people. Disadvantaged groups are easier to study because they are not as able to protect themselves and their interests. So disadvantaged groups, poor people, minorities many times, um, people who are accessible, um, you know, they don't have lots of money and power. They can't hire a lawyer to like say, get out of my face. Um, those types of groups are more accessible and social science researchers study them more frequently. So you have to be careful if you're a researcher that uh, one, if you are studying a disadvantaged group that you are treating them ethically, respectfully, mindful of the, the power differential, the power difference there. A final quote from Lunenberg here is worth thinking about. We impose our curiosity, our goals, our nosiness into other people's lives. We take their time and we reduce important elements of their lives to our data. Yes, in the long run, we hope that our efforts will benefit society in some way. In the short run, however, all of this giving on the part of our informants serves our professional needs to complete studies, write reports, and publish papers. We have to respect the trust that our informants place in us. Poor ethical conduct is not just a professional liability. It is an antisocial act against strangers who have gone out of their way to help us. Pretty powerful quote worth thinking about. These people have given their time to you as a researcher, uh, so that you can get something done, so that your agenda can be accomplished. And yes, we hope that there's some kind of greater good that comes out of it, 
But these people have given of their lives and time and stories, and we need to respect the trust and time that they have given us. All right. This research, I'm sorry, this PowerPoint comes mostly from this chapter right here in our textbook. I'd encourage you to look at it for further information. All right, and we're going to stop there.